John chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. Look at verse 2 again. The time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. The message title, can we have that door closed please? The message title is Killing in the Service of God. Killing in the service of God. You might want to hang on to this one. Are you ready? Here we go. In Old Testament Israel, Jehovah God, if I can have that as a reminder, have you got that ready to go? Has you got it so I can get the page so it won't disappear on me? Okay, so what do I got to do? It'll just stay like that. Okay. In the Old Test in Old Testament Israel, Jehovah God directly ordered the civil affairs of the nation. We know this. It was a true theocracy. God directly gave his divine revelation to the nation, expecting complete and total obedience with dire heavenly punishment over disobedience. God, through divine revelation, led Moses the Mosaic Law was instituted under the very pen and mind of God. Direct revelation from heaven to Moses, to the children of Israel. The Mosaic Law, direct revelation. Joshua, the judges, all directly led by God to lead in many times rebellion against the oppressors of Israel, bringing death to the enemies of Israel. God directly, divinely leading these men. David, the anointed king of Israel, the prophets, who received direct revelation from God and who would give that revelation to the kings of Israel and Judah with the expectation that those kings would submit to that divine revelation uttered by the prophet. Let's not forget, too, that as a part of this divine revelation in Old Testament Israel, the importance of the Urim and the Thummim Never forget the importance of that. And I'm not going to take time to go into that right now. If you don't understand it, get out your concordance, get out a dictionary, and study the Urim and the Thummim. It was a key ingredient to the divine revelation that God gave to Israel. Without the Urim and the Thummim, without Moses, without the Mosaic Law, without the prophets, without the direct divine revelation of God, these men would not have been led. They were led directly by God. Divine, direct revelation from God to man. This direct revelation from God in civil or national matters, matters of government, 
matters of war, matters of law, direct divine intervention from God in civil and national matters was limited to Old Testament Israel only. Repeat that. It was limited to Old Testament Israel only. God has not given direct divine revelation directly from the mouth and the heart of God to the mind and the heart of men since Old Testament Israel. Except through, of course, the person of Jesus Christ and the apostles who wrote the letters. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about government. And yes, in Old Testament Israel, this sometimes included God ordering the deaths of Israel's enemies. We know he did that. We know he directed Israel oftentimes to physically destroy its enemies. That was the direct revelation of God to them. The natural laws of God, the natural laws of God, which were given to man at creation, were in evidence before the Mosaic Law was ever instituted. We've talked about this a little bit in sermons past. From the time of Adam until the time of Moses, God's natural law was resident in the hearts of men and women. They knew right from wrong by conscience. God putting into the heart of man the basic natural laws of the Creator written in our hearts. Paul explains this in the book of Romans. We've talked about that, if you recall. Those natural laws preceded the Mosaic Law. They were in existence during the Mosaic Law, and they have existed ever since the Mosaic Law, and they are with us yet today. In the matter, we're talking about killing. We're talking about killing in the service of God. Jesus said, the time would come when people would kill in the service, in the name of God. So we're talking about killing. In the matter of taking human life, the one constant, the one constant, pre-law, Mosaic law, New Testament, church age, the one constant is the natural law of self-defense. Self-defense. Some of you may think God has given you direct, direct divine intervention to kill somebody. But he hasn't. He hasn't. The principle that God gave us at natural law is the principle of self-defense. Think about this. Jesus did not directly dictate divine revelation to the governments of Rome or Pharisaical Judaism. He did not. He, the Son of God, the creator of the universe, God made flesh, the Messiah and Savior, did not directly dictate divine revelation to the governments of Rome or to Pharisaical Judaism. The apostles in the book of Acts did not directly dictate divine revelation to the various civil governments of their day. 
In fact, they had all kinds of problems with the civil governments of their day. They did not in any way do as Moses did in the Old Testament. God said, you pass this law. God said, you enact this law. God said, you kill this person. God said, you take this enemy into destruction. Jesus never told the governments of his day any such message, and the apostles in their day never told the governments in which they lived anything of that nature in their day. Did they? The only direct revelation of God to the civil authority of man was in the Old Testament period of Israel's history. That's it. However, the biblical and natural law principles of God are taught throughout the scriptures, Old and New Testament. I guess I can go ahead and tell you this. Tim and I are working on a new book on, I don't know what the title is going to be just yet, but it's going to be basically the biblical evidence of natural law. And we're going to go into the entire scripture, Old and New Testaments, and we're going to show plainly from the scripture that from Genesis to Revelation, God in his word teaches natural law. A book like this hasn't been written in nearly 200 years. It's about time that we write a book like this. The natural laws of God were enforced from the beginning of human history, and they will be enforced until the end of human history. And, the, and all of the gospel writers and the Old Testament writers alike spoke to the principles of natural law which should concern us because those are the perpetual eternal laws that God has given to man by which he must govern himself. Jesus did certainly did not teach killing in his name when he walked on this earth. Did he? Where do you see Jesus commanding people to take up a sword and go kill the infidels in his name? Just the opposite. John chapter 18, verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from thence. In an act of lawful self-defense in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus stopped Simon Peter from exercising that right of self-defense and did not rebuke him for that, by the way. That's completely misinterpreted by 90% of our clergymen today. Simply letting him know that it was not time for him to use the sword, that Jesus came, that he might be arrested, that he might go through this phony trial, and that he might go to the cross and die for the sins of the world. Jesus was not dying as a martyr. He was not dying as a soldier. He was dying as a savior for the sins of mankind. None of us are going to die as a savior for the sins of mankind. We are not the Messiah. We are not the savior of the world. His mission to die was unique to the person of the Son of God. And he told Simon, it's not time to use that sword. There is a time to fight. This is not it. I must go through with this. Jesus certainly did not teach killing infidels in his name. In fact, he warned the disciples in the passage of our text 
There will come time when people are going to kill and they're going to use the name of God to do it. But the problem is they don't know me and they don't know my Heavenly Father. God is not sending them to kill. The apostles didn't advocate killing in God's name. Where do you find in any of the epistles of the apostles? When I first started learning the Bible, I thought the epistles of the apostles, I thought the, the epistles were the wives of the apostles. <laughs> apostles and epistles came to town. <laughs> epistles mean letters. And no place do you see in the epistles the instruction to go out and kill in God's name. Where do you find that? It's not there. Killing in God's name is an attitude that many people in our world today have. Holy war is another word for it. Many Christians in our churches today see the conflict between the Muslim nations in the Middle East and America as some sort of holy war. We are killing infidels in the name of God is the attitude that permeates many of our churches and our pulpits in America today. Absolutely, don't tell me I'm making this up. Go read my Facebook page the last couple of weeks. They see it as loyalty to God to fight and kill Muslims. We are loyal to God when we go kill Muslims. And if we are not willing to go kill Muslims, we must be idolatrous. We must be embracing idolatry. We're accepting Islam if we're not willing to go kill them in the name of God. But ladies and gentlemen, is not that the exact same attitude that the Muslim jihadists have about us. Their attitude to kill the infidels is not of God. But our attitude to go kill the infidels, it is of God. The fact is, neither is of God. Why cannot our Christians and our pastors recognize the manipulation of nations that's being done surreptitiously by our own government in Washington, D.C. Why is it so hard to understand that our own government in Washington, D.C. is fomenting hatred against the people of the United States, especially in the Middle East, for purposes that have more to do with enacting globalism than it does protecting the security of the United States of America. Why is it so hard for Christian people to believe that? Just like that comment I made from the fellow a few moments ago in the, in the letters. Our military would never allow any atrocity to go on. Oh really, remember a little thing called My Lai in Vietnam? Have I forgot about that? I'm in contact with special ops troops, retired 
from all branches of government often. And if you've ever talked to them and if they've, if they've ever been honest with you about some of the things that they've witnessed with their own eyes, some of the things that they know to be true because of the, of the roles that they played and the positions that were, they were in as special forces, special ops, black ops, people around the world, you would know that our government is involved in all kinds of unconstitutional, illegal, immoral, unlawful conduct around the world, stirring the pot of hatred which is precipitating most of the conflict that we're in right now. It was not that long ago when Iran was one of the biggest allies the United States had. Iran was our friend. Was that regime pure and holy? Of course not. The regime in Washington, D.C. is not pure and holy. But they were a friend to the United States until we abandoned them and turned them over to the Ayatollah. Our CIA did that. Our CIA put Osama bin Laden in power. Our CIA put Saddam Hussein in power. And then we send our skies over there to risk life and limb to take out the very ones that they Put in power. Give me a break. If you're going to be angry with somebody, be angry with those miscreants in Washington, D.C. The hatred and bigotry of Christian people against Muslim people represent a fundamental and glaring sin. Hatred is a sin. I don't care who the object of your hatred is. Hatred is a sin. It's a sin that has the potential of bringing down our republic. It's not Muslims, but it's the hatred of Muslims that is the church's problem. I simply said initially, when I stepped into this pile of dung that I stepped into, that not every Muslim is a violent jihadist. Not every Muslim person is a threat to the United States of America. I simply said you cannot take the entire Muslim world, lump them all into one group, and damn them all as murderers and and jihadists and terrorists. There are millions of Muslims in this country that have lived among us all of our lives and they've done so peacefully. I have met many of them and they're not all haters of America. That's all I said. Whoa. Bob just showed me this. Are we able to do, are we able to put this up? Okay. All right. Hang on. Before let's see. Where, how do I do this? Red velvet Oreo sugar cookie donut <laughs> stuffed with cookies and cream, Oreos, cookie dough, and buttercream icing. That's what it says. Hey, forgive him, he's a retired colonel. He had people do this kind of stuff for him. 
Amen? I'm in the same boat. I'm exactly where you are. All right. This is a video. It's about a 15-second video of, a, of an elderly Muslim lady in Syria who is publicly rebuking some members of ISIS over their violent conduct. I'm reading the report from what you're going to watch. The woman recites poetry and verses from the Quran to the militants during an angry tirade. Listen. Oh, you devils. She's talking to ISIS, a Muslim lady in Syria. Oh, you devils. Turn back to God. What you are doing is forbidden. She says at the rate fighting is going, neither ISIS nor Assad will win. She, and she said this, listen to this. What have I been saying the last couple of weeks about ISIS became overnight this great threat, Al-Qaeda, overnight. Where did they get the money? Where did they get the weapons? They got it from our own CIA. All these people criticize, oh, Chuck, how can you say that? You have no idea what you're talking Our government would never do that. Listen to what she, this elderly lady said. Now that ISIS has money from America and weapons from America, they want to murder each other. Even this old lady in Syria knows that they got the weapons from America, they got the money from America. The people of the, of the Middle East know it. The American people don't know it because all they watch is Fox News. The believers are but brothers, so make settlement between your brothers. She's calling for peace between the, the Muslim brotherhood. When the fighter rudely says he's going to leave her, she warns, God is watching what you're doing. Can we show that? بين الله بين الله بالدنيا بيقول لك صلى استخاره كان يصفق يسقط النظام اسالي سقط ما بيسقط النظام لا الله بيرضى يسقط النظام ولا ارضى بنجحكم ولا بنجحكم كله شرقي بعض قال احنا جوكم وانت عور خليها الطابق مستور يا عرب يا حاجه والله حاجة. الرجل شلت من الممشى عيت على عير بير عرعوره الله اكبر من الكذب عندكم كمشه أيه. ومن الكذب مطموره نبجوره من القمح ما عندهم كمشه والكذب مطموره نبجوره ارجعوا لله ارجعوا ان شاء الله عرقوره بتغزل للحديد دولتكم ملعونه لا خير في كثير من نجواهم الا من امر بصدقات او معروف او اصلاح بين الناس لا لا. وان طائفتان من المؤمنين اقتتلوا فاصلحوا بينهما فان بغت احداهما على الاخرى التي هي تبغي حتى تفيء الى امر الله فان فات فاصلحوا بينهما بالعدل واقسطوا الله يحب المقسطين انما المؤمنون اخوة فاصلحوا بين اخويكم واتقوا الله لعلكم ترحمون في 50 مره هون متجوزات شيعيات يعني مثل اللي بتجوز الدبه وبرفع ليلها بالعوده ارجعوا الى الله ارجعوا الى الله ارجعوا الى الله ارجعوا الى الله خافوا من الله ما بدكم هالذبح ولا بدكم هالقتل جيناكم بالذبح اهجموا 
وأعدوا لهم ما استطعتم من قوة ومن رباط الخيل ترهبون به عدو الله وعدوكم يوم حرب الزيران الشاطرة اللي بدها تخبي ابنها ويلطمون عروس ما بدناش يروحوا أما يوم جتكم مصاري أمريكا وسلاح أمريكا بدكم يخدلوا بعضكم كيفوا عقدت البعض كلامك صحيح حاجة ارجعوا إلى الله خلاص عم روحين خلاص عم روحين يا جد وجع ولقد أهلكنا القرون من قبلكم لما ظلموا وجاءتهم رسلهم بالبينات وما كانوا ليؤمنوا كذلك نجزي القوم المجرمين كذلك نجزي ثم جعلناكم خلائف في الأرض من بعدهم لننظر كيف تعملون قاعد ينظر كيف تعملوا بعدين إن الذين كذبوا بآياتنا واستكبروا عنها لا تفتح لهم أبواب السماء ولا يدخلون الجنة حتى يلج الجمل في سم الخياط وكذلك نجزي المجرمين لهم من جهنم مهاد ومن فوقهم غواش وكذلك نجزي الظالمين ارجعوا يا جد a Muslim, an elderly Muslim lady with the courage to stand face to face with ISIS men, not regarding her own life, quoting the Quran and telling them that they are going to hell for what they're doing, telling them that they are not of God, telling them that God is not with them, that what they're doing is not of God. Now, tell you what, all you people that want to say that every single Muslim in the world hates us and is our enemy and wants to kill us, I'll, I'll, I'll pay your plane ticket to go over to Syria and have a face-to-face -face talk with this woman. And those of you who think that our American dollars aren't financing ISIS and Al-Qaeda and all these other terrorists over there, same offer. Go talk to this lady. They say, Chuck, have you ever read the Quran? Hundreds of people have screamed that at me. And I ask, have you ever read the Talmud? Now it's going to get quiet. Now's not the time to give out a large, bur a large burp because everybody's going to hear it. <laughs> Have you ever read the Talmud? The Talmud means oral law. Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, Sadducees, and others before and after them believe that when God gave the, the written law to Moses, he gave an oral law to Moses. And that the oral law is actually greater in authority than the written law. They have more respect for the Talmud, the oral law, than they do the Torah, the written law. Jesus referred to this when he talked to the Pharisees and he talked about the traditions of men. He's talking about the Talmud. He's talking about the oral law that the Pharisees operated under. Have you ever read the Talmud? The Bible of the Pharisees, the Bible of the Jewish leaders. Even today, many of the leaders of Judaism are, are believers in the Talmud. They read the Talmud much more than they read the Torah or the Pentateuch. Have you read it? Let me give you a few quotes. When the Messiah comes, every Jew will have 2,800 slaves. Another quote, that the Jewish nation is the only nation selected by God while all the remaining ones are contemptible and hateful. Another one, that all property of other nations belongs to the Jewish nation, which consequently is entitled to seize upon it without any scruples. An Orthodox Jew is not bound to observe principles of morality towards people of other tribes. He may act contrary to morality if it is profitable to himself or to Jews in general. How about another one? Kill the Gentile by any means possible. How about another one? 
Everyone who sheds the blood of the non-Jew is as acceptable to God as he who offers a sacrifice to God. Give you another one. The non-Jew is consequently an animal in human form and condemned to serve the Jew day and night. Give you one more. A Jew may violate but not marry a non-Jewish girl. And there are many other quotes in there that are much more graphic than those that I just read. What about that? The persecution of the Jewish leaders against Christ and his apostles during the book of Acts is the factual history of the New Testament. It is a fact that the Jewish leaders took seriously the words of the Talmud and they persecuted the church and they died, many of them, cruel, barbarous deaths. Skinned alive, beheaded, slain with the sword, cut in two, had limbs torn apart by wild animals. John the Apostle boiled in oil, though he survived. The cruelty of these people against the early Christians is undeniable. But never in one passage of scripture in the entire New Testament do you read the apostles saying anything like, there's no such thing as a peaceful Jew. Where do you see that in the New Testament? They were persecuted by Jews. They were jailed by Jews. They were beaten by Jews. They were murdered by Jews. You never hear one of them say, there's no such thing as a peaceful Jew. You hear them say things like the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 9 and verse 6, for they are not all of Israel which are of Israel. Two kinds of Israel. There's a real Israel, and there's a phony Israel. There's more than one kind of Muslim. There are Muslims like that, that dear elderly lady that we just saw, and then there's Muslims like ISIS. Don't tell me they're all one and the same. What an insult to my intelligence. Now, if you read the Jewish apologists, which I have, they will argue, they will argue till they're blue in the face that the above verses that I just read from the, from the uh, sacred book of, of Judaism, the Talmud, is taken out of context. And they will quote other verses from the Talmud which seem to contradict the verses that I just read. And Muslim apologists will do the same. They will argue that the verses that are being used to say that they all believe in holy jihad against everyone who's not a Muslim is taken out of context. And they will quote other verses from the Quran that seem to speak contrary to those sentiments. But let's just be intellectually honest as we continue here. It's not just Jews and Muslims that have a history of violence against infidels. Hold on to your seats now. If there's a seat built on the seat, you might want to get it. Because this is something you're not going to hear from hardly any pastor in any church in this country. But every word is fact and true. For over 300 years, the Roman Catholic Church, through their various inquisitions, persecuted, tortured, imprisoned, and murdered. Some say hundreds of thousands, some say millions, that might be an exaggeration. Conservatively speaking, somewhere between 10 and 100,000 people will cruelly 
torturously killed by the Roman Catholic Church during the Inquisitions of the Dark Ages and the Spanish Inquisition. Somewhere between 10 and 10 and 100,000, conservatively. Some, some historians say millions. I think that's probably a little exaggerated. Thousands more were persecuted, hands cut off, tongues pulled out, tortured, imprisoned, starved, beaten, because they were heretics. They were infidels. They wouldn't submit to Roman doctrine. But guess what? It wasn't just Catholics. Protestants also persecuted and killed in the name of God. Muslims were killing in the name of Allah. Jews were killing in the name of Jehovah. Catholics were killing in the name of the Virgin Mary and Jesus Christ. And Protestants, too, killed infidels in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Lutheran towns of Lubbock, Bremen, Hamburg, Lundberg, Stralsund, Rostock, Wismar, all voted, voted, the people voted to hang Anabaptists. That would be the ancestors of the Baptist faith. They voted to hang Anabaptists and flog and banish Catholics and Zwinglians from their homelands. Martin Luther said of the Roman Catholic leaders, quote, if I had all the Franciscan friars in one house, I would set fire to it, to the fire with them. Luther, who by the way, Lutherans don't know this, but in 1518, before he taught infant baptism, Luther actually taught baptism by immersion. Did you know that? Interesting. Luther taught that dissenters, people that didn't agree with his doctrine, should be banished. And said, quote, the peasants, these were the people involved in the so-called peasants' war in Germany, would not listen. They would not let anyone tell them anything. Their ears must be unbuttoned with bullets till their heads jump off their shoulders. On the obstinate, hardened, blinded peasants, let no one have mercy, but let everyone, as he is able, hew, stab, slay, lay about him as though among mad dogs, so that peace and safety may be maintained. Close quote, Martin Luther, about peasants in Germany, his own country. Luther was even more vicious toward the Jews. He said, quote, First, set fire to their synagogues or schools and bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever see again a stone or cinder of them. This is to be done in the honor of our Lord and of Christendom so that God might see that we are Christians and do not condone or knowingly tolerate such public lying, cursing, and blaspheming of his son and of his Christians. Closed quote. Would anyone, anyone dare suggest that there's no such thing as a peace-loving Lutheran because of the words of Martin Luther? Huh? No such thing as a peace-loving Lutheran after what you heard Martin Luther say. Really? Anybody going to suggest that? A man was arrested in 1547 for writing on one of Calvin's, John Calvin's, religious pamphlets, we call them tracts in religious parlance, 
on one of Calvin's tracks, he wrote the words, all rubbish. He took one of Calvin's pamphlets and he wrote, rubbish. He was put on a rack twice a day for a month. And then on July 26, 1547, they cut his head off. They cut his head off because he said that what Calvin wrote was rubbish. Death sentence. The Spanish reformer Servetus had dared to criticize Calvin's institutes of the Christian religion, and Calvin declared, and I quote, If he comes here and I have any authority, I will never let him leave this place alive. Close quote. Servetus was an anti Trinitarian. He disagreed with Calvin via correspondence. And when he visited Geneva on August 13, 1553, he went to hear Calvin preach. Calvin saw him in the church, had him arrested. Calvin drew up 40 charges against him, including Servetus' opposition to infant baptism and his attack upon the preaching of Calvin. On August 20, 1553, Calvin wrote, I hope that Servetus will be condemned to death. Unquote. And in October of that year, the Geneva Council ordered that he be burned alive the next day. John Calvin. Heretics were hanged and then burned in Zurich and Geneva for disagreeing with Calvin's teaching. During the first five years of Calvin's rule in the small town of Geneva, 13 people were hanged, 10 were decapitated, 35 were burned to death while they were alive. A citizen, listen to this, a citizen under Calvin, a citizen could go to prison for smiling during a baptismal service or sleeping during a church service. Many of you are going to jail. Would anyone dare suggest that there's no such thing as a peace-loving Presbyterian because of John Calvin's statements and actions? Ludicrous. Ludicrous. In England, Henry VIII was the head of the Church of England. Of course, Henry formed after his break with Rome. And doctrinal disagreements now became high treason to be punished by disembowelment while still alive. Like what we saw depicted in the movie Braveheart. Hanging, quartering. In the end, even failing to denounce someone else who criticized these things became treason. Can you imagine? You disagree with the Anglican church, you're going to be disemboweled, quartered, sawn asunder. Those who left England and Europe trying to escape the tyranny of, of, of the Church of England and find religious liberty were guilty of imposing their own convictions upon others. They fled religious tyranny. They came to America. And after they came to America, they became religious tyrants themselves. Virginia had established the Anglican Church, the Church of England, and forbade Quakers and Baptists to assemble. Quakers it was against the law to have a church service. Baptists against the law to have a church service. And not only that, Virginia citizens, including Baptists and Quakers, were forced to pay the salaries of Anglican preachers through their own tax dollars. The Puritans demanded freedom from themselves in England, but when they came to America, they restricted the freedom of others. 
They tried to outdo what they had endured. In Massachusetts and Virginia, Baptists and Quakers were whipped, jailed, property confiscated, beaten, killed, murdered. Virginia, Massachusetts. Would anyone dare suggest that there's no such thing as a peace-loving Episcopalian? because of the actions of some of the Puritans? Really? Look what they wrote. Look what they said. Look what they did. We're not talking about just for a day or a week or a month. We're talking about years, decades, sometimes centuries. The incredible phenomenon of professing Christians, torturing, jailing, and killing professing Christians is almost unknown by the Christians of America today. I guarantee you the vast majority of your Christian friends have never heard what I just told you one time in their whole lives. We all know how Muslims kill Muslims and non-Muslims alike. And we're horrified as we see they behead their enemies. As rightly we should be horrified and repulsed by any such barbarity, by any person in this world. But remember, professing Christians did the same and worse to their enemies. And not a word about it. Jews, Muslims, Catholics, Protestants, all have a history of killing in the name of God. And after what I've seen over the last two or three weeks, and the way that so many Christians in America today are guilty of hatred in their hearts, we could see Christians killing Christians in this country all over again. It is a distinct potentiality. The hatred is already there. No wonder our churches are filled with such division. No wonder half of the churches in America are split from somebody else's church. No wonder there's such rancor, bitterness, jealousy, backbiting, discord among the church. No wonder we have such a church. Our people are filled with hate. The light and love of Christ is not in them. They are filled with hatred and bigotry. In the name of Jesus. Some call themselves Christians and hate Jews. Some call themselves Christians and hate blacks and minorities. Some call themselves Christians and hate whites. Some call themselves Christians and hate Catholics. Some call themselves Christians and hate Masons. Some call themselves Christians and hate Democrats. Some call themselves Christians and hate Republicans. Some call themselves Christians and hate Muslims. Some call themselves Christians and hate Chuck Baldwin. <laughs> Some call themselves Christians and hate Ron Paul. I had, again, our people are not reading. They, they're knee-jerk emotional reactionists. They have no power to think. They just, it's all emotion. Somebody says something and flames an emotion and off they go. Spread it on the internet. Didn't give 30 seconds of thought and study and research and reason as to what they just sent was true. Or even sensible. Oh, I like that. It feeds my prejudice. I don't like them. It feeds my bias. It feeds my bigotry. Send it out. And 
half the stuff on the internet is nothing more than one bigoted person sending his bigotry to other bigoted people. Patting each other on the bat. Oh, wow, I sure do like your bigotry. It agrees with my bigotry. Wow, aren't we great? The whole rest of the world stinks, but we got it together. Had several of me say, Chuck, you don't know what you're talking about. God said he hated the Nicolaitans, and God said the church in Revelation hated the Nicolaitans. You don't know what you're talking about. It's perfectly right in the scripture to hate. They don't read. Take your Bible and read Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. What you're going to hear, you're going to hear this. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Yes. The deeds of the Nicolaitans are despicable. The deeds of these barbaric ISIS-type terrorists is despicable. The deeds of people who murder and steal and kill and rape and pillage, of whatever race, whatever gender, whatever generation, whatever region, whatever society, whatever religion, it's despicable! We will fight evil when we have the opportunity to do so. We will resist when we have the opportunity to do so. Our whole heart and our whole soul, we will defend what is right in our homes, in our families, in our community, and yes, in our country. Amen. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Got it. Got it. Hate Muslims. Hate Jews. Hate Catholics. Hate blacks. Hate minorities. Hate Masons. Hate Protestants. Hate whites. Hate Democrats. Hate people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen. Love your enemies. Hating evil is not equate to hating people, my friends. any people. America was founded not as a Baptist country or a Lutheran country or a Presbyterian country. America was founded on the natural law principles of liberty and of the specific principle of religious liberty. In America, we don't put people in prison because they assemble in a Baptist congregation. We don't whip and scourge and kill people because they're Quakers. We give every person the freedom to worship God according to dictates of his own conscience or not worship God at all if he so chooses. Adherence to these principles lifted America to greatness, including the principle of neutrality in the affairs of foreign nations. I tell you the truth, I lie not. If America would get out of the Middle East, if it would get out of the United Nations, the vast majority of these international conflicts that we are mired in would Go away. The rejection of God's natural laws will bring America into judgment 
And God will decide by whom that judgment will come. And it won't matter what you think about it or what I think about it. If God chooses to use the Muslim people, the militants of the Muslim people, to bring judgment on America, that's God's doing. He used the Assyrians, he used the Babylonians to judge Old Testament Israel. God can use any pagan world that he might choose to bring judgment against his people. It's not Muslims we should fear, it's God we should fear. Freedom-oriented Americans are not going to submit to any kind of foreign or domestic law that would seek to enslave them. Come on. If, if, if there are people in some of these places around the, the, the California and New England, if some of those folks want to vote themselves into socialism and in tyranny, they can help themselves. I'm here to tell you, and I don't have to tell you, you already know it, but for those of those who are watching online, the people of the Flathead Valley in Montana are not going to submit to Sharia law or Talmudic law or Popish law or Puritan law or any other tyrannical law. We're not going to do it. Washington can do whatever they want or not want. New York City can do what it wants or not wants. Chicago can do what it wants. LA can do what it wants. The Flathead Valley is not going to submit to forced tyranny. Amen. And by the way, we're not going to submit to forced tyranny from Washington, D.C. either. America has a host of problems. Most of them, most of them are emanating directly, first from our churches, and secondly from our nation's capital. All this trouble that we're having in public education is coming down from the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. That's why you're having trouble in your public schools. That's why you're having problem with, with your environmental laws and OSHA and EPA and all this stuff that won't let people have, enact their industry and, and utilize the resources that's sitting right under the ground here in the greatest treasure state in the whole country. It all flows down from D.C., every bit of it. By the way, that our federal government refuses to seal our southern border proves, 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 proves that our international war on terror is nothing but a duplicitous facade. If Washington, D.C. was really worried about ISIS, which they helped create, if they were really worried about ISIS, if they were really worried about Qaeda, if they were really worried about Muslim terrorists, they would have sealed that southern border back in 2001. But they haven't done it, and they're not going to do it. Why? Because they know there is no war on terror except the war that they have made up so that they might enslave us because we're so given to fear and hatred and a, a scared people would not surrender liberty, I mean, will surrender liberties that people would not surrender if they were not afraid. Christians may think that we're fighting some kind of a holy war in the Middle East if they want to. Patriotic Americans may think we're fighting for freedom in the Middle East if they want to. But what we're really doing is nothing more than foreign interventionism, nation building, international meddling, and the promotion of globalism. That's what we're doing in the Middle East. Jesus said, the time cometh, that whosoever killeth you will think he doeth God's service.
killing in the name of God is not new. And it didn't originate in Al-Qaeda. There's plenty of blame to go around. There's nothing new about killing in the name of God. It isn't going on for a millennial. But those who know Christ, Jesus said, this they do because they don't know me or my Father. Those who know Christ and those who know the Father should never be counted among them. Let's stand for prayer. Oh, he directed Israel oftentimes to physically destroy its enemies. That was the direct revelation of God to them. The natural laws of God, the natural laws of God, which were given to man at creation, were in evidence before the Mosaic Law was ever instituted. We've talked about this a little bit in sermons past. From the time of Adam until the time of Moses, God's natural law was resident in the hearts of men and women. They knew right from wrong by conscience. God putting into the heart of man the basic natural laws of the Creator written in our hearts. Paul explains this in the book of Romans. We've talked about that, if you recall. Those natural laws preceded the Mosaic Law. They were in existence during the Mosaic Law, and they have existed ever since the Mosaic Law, and they are with us yet today. In the matter, we're talking about killing. We're talking about killing in the service of God. Jesus said the time would come from God to man. This direct revelation from God in civil or national matters, matters of government, matters of war, matters of law, direct divine intervention from God in civil and national matters was limited to Old Testament Israel only. Repeat that. It was limited to Old Testament Israel only. God has not given direct divine revelation directly from the mouth and the heart of God to the mind and the heart of men since Old Testament Israel. Except through, of course, the person of Jesus Christ and the apostles who wrote the letters. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about government. And yes, in Old Testament Israel, this sometimes included God ordering the deaths of Israel's enemies. We know he did that. We know do. It'll just stay like that. Okay. In the Old Test in Old Testament Israel, Jehovah God directly ordered the civil affairs of the nation. We know this. It was a true theocracy. God directly gave his divine revelation to the nation, expecting complete and total obedience with dire heavenly punishment over disobedience. God, through divine revelation, 
led Moses. The Mosaic law was instituted under the very pen and mind of God. Direct revelation from heaven to Moses, to the children of Israel. The Mosaic law, direct revelation. Joshua, the judges, all directly led by God to lead John chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. These things have I spoken unto you, that you should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. And these things will they do unto you, because they have not known the Father, nor me. Look at verse 2 again. The time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God service. The message title, can we have that door closed please? The message title is Killing in the Service of God. Killing in the Service of God. You might want to hang on to this one. Are you ready? Here we go. In Old Testament Israel, Jehovah God, if I can have that as a reminder, have you got that ready to go? Has yep. he got it so I can, you got the page so it won't disappear on me? Yep. Okay, so what do I got? And many times, rebellion against the oppressors of Israel, bringing death to the enemies of Israel. God directly, divinely leading these men. David, the anointed king of Israel. The prophets who received direct revelation from God and who would give that revelation to the kings of Israel and Judah with the expectation that those kings would submit to that divine revelation uttered by the prophet. Let's not forget, too, that as a part of this divine revelation in Old Testament Israel, the importance of the Urim and the Thummim. Never forget the importance of that. And I'm not going to take time to go into that right now. If you don't understand it, get out your concordance, get out a dictionary, and study the Urim and the Thummim. It was a key ingredient to the divine revelation that God gave to Israel. Without the Urim and the Thummim, without Moses, without the Mosaic Law, without the prophets, without the direct divine revelation of God, these men would not have been led. They were led directly by God. Divine, direct revelation 